thank you so much and thanks for coming here. It's a privilege to speak to such an expert audience. So I hope you all got a copy of the report, but if you didn't, it's the PDF version is available online. So, so my presentation is based on the re report and it's about the US and NATO missile defense plans in Europe. And the key argument in the report is that the current expansion of the missile defenses in Europe uh, should be placed on hold because there is uh, no credible security rationale that would uh, justify it and because it's undermining rather than increasing regional security. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> nice to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll also be focusing on a lot on Iranian nuclear and missile capabilities, or I focused on that in the report because that has been the key justification for the system, especially here in the US. Uh, but at the same time, I stress that the, some of the key assumptions behind um, uh, related to Iran's intentions, uh, they are rather questionable. And, and instead of empirical reality, they can be understood against the background of US-Iranian relations, which have been uh, marked by decades of mutual enmity and estrange estrangement with Iran. Uh, and, and they also have to do with this concept of rogue state that emerged after the Cold War and with uh, kind of replace the Soviet threat in American security discourse. And from the point of view of missile defense, the key assumption in the rogue state discourse was that uh, rogue states were so irrational and aggressive that normal laws of deterrence might not apply to them. And this thinking coincided with the US shift in, um, to from strategic to theater missile defenses in the 90s and that was triggered especially by by the Iraqi Scott missile attacks during the Gulf War and but then later in the 1990s this idea of broke state missile threat it, it was um, linked to long-range missiles and and the Rumsfeld report at the end of the decade, it played a key role in in promoting this idea or highlighting the threat of uh, that rogue states might launch a long-range ballistic missile armed with a nuclear we weapon against the, the United States. And at the time, Iran, Iraq, and North Korea were mentioned, and <coughs> and it was yeah, it was in the report. It, it was said that they could all develop long-range missiles, you know, and both nuclear weapons and long-range missiles uh, on short not notice. And that logic was also the rationale for the national, um, for the 1999 Missile Defense Act, and that was the base, although that was adopted during the Clinton administration, it was the basis for the Bush administration's uh, ambitious national missile defense plans that um, that started in early 2000s, um, and because, because the U.S. or the Bush administration at the time wanted to reserve the right to develop uh, missile defenses without any constraints, it decided to withdraw from the anti-ballistic missile treaty that the U.S. had signed with the Soviet Union in 1972, and as can be seen in this quote, the the Bush administration was basically arguing that the, uh, that the threat environment had changed dramatically, that the um, US and Russia no longer viewed each other as enemies, and the, that the rogue state threat was so um, urgent that it required new kinds of missile defenses. So soon after this, the Bush administration started to deploy um, these uh, ground-based interceptors in 
here in California and and in Alaska, uh, and and they were thought to be suitable against the North Korean threat, but for the Iranian threat, it was thought that um, the U.S. needed a third side, and and the idea was to <coughs> build that third side in Europe, and and um, by 2007, although the negotiations with Poland and the Czech Republic started already on the first half of the decade. On 2007, formal negotiations started with with Poland and the Czech Republic about the deployment of, of interceptors and a radar um, in Eastern Europe. And so this is how the US plans for missile defenses in Europe started. And this is also how the dispute uh, the about missile defense with Russia started, although the Russian reaction to the U.S. withdrawal from the ABM Treaty has been quite mild, it strongly reacted to the to the plans to deploy these systems in Eastern Europe, and and basically the the Russian concern was that this might undermine its nuclear deterrent, and it was basically it was the same concern that the U.S. had had about the Soviet ABM systems in the 1960s, and that actually led to the ABM Treaty. And and it's the same concern that uh, the Soviet Union had in the 1980s about Reagan's Star Wars plan, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And in both of those cases, the concerns were exaggerated, and also in, I mean, the, the concerns about missile defense in Europe, they are also exaggerated, but but anyway, they have the same logic, and they have, even though they are exaggerated, they have had concrete um, concrete consequences for nuclear arms control. For example, the ABM Treaty was was um, agreed together with the uh, reduction of strategic nuclear arms and. In the 1980s, the, the Star Wars plans, they actually prevented nuclear disarmament. At least Reagan and Gorbachev had very, seemed to come very close to actually eliminating all nuclear weapons. But then they disagreed on whether to test, about the testing and development of, of missile defenses. And and ever since then, Russia has sought to link missile defense to nuclear arms control talks. So, so it was not really surprising that Russia also linked the, these plans in Europe um, to the New START talks and, and saw it as an obstacle to the New START treaty. So, so when the Obama administration uh, came to power, they sought to address these concerns because they had the disarmament agenda and an interest in the in in having the new start treaty negotiated, and also because they recognized that there was no ICBM, the long range missile threat from Iran. So 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 on that basis the Obama administration decided to scale down the Bush plan, and in September 2009 they introduced the so-called European phased adaptive approach, and it was called um, adaptive because the idea was to adapt to the Iranian threat, so instead of the hypothetical ICBMs that the Bush plan, hypothetical Iranian ICBMs that the Bush plan was supposed to defend against, this new plan would focus on Iran's actual capabilities, which meant short and medium range missiles that Iran had at the time. And, and there was a quote from Obama that he actually said before announcing the plan, um, saying that if the threat from Iran's nuclear and ballistic missile program if programs is eliminated, the driving force for missile defense in Europe will be eliminated. And, and this seems to open the door for missile defense, 
cooperation between the US and, and Russia, and it also um, contributed to the decision by NATO to adopt EPAA, the European Safe Adaptive Approach, as official policy in November 2010. So, so the, in addition to being adaptive, the EPAA was uh, phased. So it had originally it had four phases, although the last phase was cancelled in 2013, and although the first three phases focused on, okay, the first two phases focused on short and medi medium range missiles, they were supposed to protect like southern, southeastern Europe from short and medium range missiles from the Middle East. The third phase was to be against intermediate range missiles and so to protect the rest of Europe from Iranian missiles and phase four was came close to the Bush plans because it was against ICBMs but like I said it was cancelled in 2013 and and the first two phases have been completed but the phase three is now underway it started immediately after the completion of the of the Romanian site which was part of the, okay part the phase three was about deploying Aegis ships in the Mediterranean and Aegis ships have um, the so-called standard missile three um, block, block uh, one interceptors and Phase three, they introduced uh, block um, block one B interceptors on those ships, but also um, this new land-based site in Romania, and and the phase three is supposed to introduce this significantly more capable block two A interceptor uh, by the end of 2018 both to the Romanian side and, and to the ships in the Mediterranean. Um, the Russian response to the EPAA was originally, or initially it was positive and, and actually it, um, it started consultations with the US. Actually those started already, I think in the summer, before the EPAA was announced and but the talks in the uh, between NATO and Russia began after November 2010, and and Russia first made a so-called sectoral proposal, where it um, proposed that Russia and NATO would would take care of separate sectors in protecting Europe. But that proposal was a bit unrealistic, and I guess the Russians quickly understood it or made, a way, made it clear from the beginning that they wouldn't um, accept it and then Russia shifted its attention to calling for legal limits to the missile defenses in Europe but the US was against any legal limits but instead NATO made then this counter proposal of joint missile defense centers and basically uh, as I understand it, it was mostly about transparency, but Russia wasn't interested in that. So, so it, those talks didn't really lead anywhere, and and actually Russia suspended the missile defense consultations already was it October 2013, but the they had become quite disillusioned with the with the talks already by November 2011 and then Medvedev made this so-called ultimatum about, it was a kind of a Russian phase adaptive approach, like a re responding to the, to the NATO plan um, step by step. So, so the phases of the steps from one to four, they said that they would take immediately and this uh, included building nuclear missiles that would be capable of uh, penetrating the missile defenses and 
and it also included the plan to deploy Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad um, to take out NATO missile defense system components and and withdrawal from the new start was also mentioned as the last measure but but these last steps uh, Medvedev said that they would only take if if necessary if the if the system kept expanding um, and actually those um, that uh, threat about Iskander missiles it was uh, put into practice last year in October, I think there were news that Russia had finally deployed the Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad and this was in the context of the Ukraine crisis it, it um, well it's been interpreted that as part of this general pattern of aggressiveness of Russian aggressiveness in in Europe and and the missile defense dispute has kind of been um, in the background and and because of this partly this has so only increased NATO's resolve to stick to their plans even though they are um, outdated to show that they are not intimidated by the Russian threat so they have been a little bit counterproductive or paradoxical um, and at the same time, NATO has, seems to have forgotten what was the actual purpose of the system um, and to ignore the fact that there are really no missile threats from the Middle East that would ex justify expanding the system. And this applies especially to phase three in Poland. So, so the first two phases they, of the EPAA, they can be seen to make some sense because there are Many Middle Eastern countries have short-range missiles, and Iran and some other countries have, uh, or Israel has medium-range missiles. Um, but this was anyway supposed to be against nuclear-armed missiles, so not a very good justification. But anyway, they there can be seen to be justification for them, but but. As for the phase three, there is really no security rationale um, because there are no Iran has no intermediate range missiles that could reach Central Europe or even Poland. Um, and here is a very beautiful map that was made by the CNS, <laughs> actually, uh, and this shows the range of Iranian missiles. And the inner circle is the uh, longest range operational medium range missile that Iran has, the Gadir, and it has a range of, um, of 1,600 kilometers. Uh, I mean, it can reach some NATO countries, but it can, it's very far from Poland. And the outer circle is Sajil 2, which is 2,000 kilometers, or so the range is 2,000 kilometers, but this. I mean, this, uh, according to Elman, it seems that the development of the missile has run into technical dif difficulties. It hasn't been tested for six years, I think, so it's not operational. And so you can see Poland is there on the left, and and the Iranian missiles can't really reach Poland. Um, and the counter argument to this typically is that anyway it's good to build the site to prepare for the future because Iran is testing its missiles and and so it's good to have it in advance but but I don't think this argument makes much sense because uh, because long-range missiles they don't just pop out of nowhere like mushrooms they require testing and and this will not go unnoticed and here's a quote from Elliman, who says that typically testing new missiles takes at least three to five years of testing. And and another counter argument that is often made is the Iranian space programs. For example, a few few weeks ago at CSIS there was uh, what was his title? His name was 
uh, Malton, the, the former director of operations at US European Command, was arguing that Iran's space program gives Iran the ability to produce long-range missiles instantaneously, which is quite a bold claim considering that no country has made uh, developed long-range missiles out of space programs, although they, there are many examples of countries doing the re reverse, um, but few examples of, of that, and even if Iran would manage to do that, it would those missiles would still need to be tested and and that would be noticed. And Iran doesn't even seem to be interested in intermediate range missiles. Like Elements said in his testimony to the Congress last year that he has seen no indication of Iran trying to develop intermediate or intercontinental ballistic missiles. And, and the Iranian officials have already uh, also gone on record saying that they they have no need for missiles more than uh, two, 2,000 kilometer range. And, and there's also the Iran nuclear deal that was negotiated in 2015. And Iran can't develop nuclear weapons as long as it continues implementing the deal. And it, until now it has implemented it. And even if it would break out from the deal, there is the, the breakout time is built into it, and it would, I mean, the breakout time that it would take Iran to produce enough material for one nuclear bomb, and that's one year, my, that's one year, but that's only material for a nuclear bomb, and it's another thing to make that material, to turn, turn that material into a bomb, and it's very unlikely that. Iran would do this all this in one year, and and Elman also points to another challenge because Iran's missiles can't <coughs> deliver warheads more weighing more than 750 kilos, so that would be a major obstacle or like a challenge if it would want to develop that one nuclear bomb, and and what does Iran do with one nuclear bomb? I mean if it it probably needs to test it also. So, and then finally, there's the most fundamental question: Why would Iran want to attack Europe? I mean, the relations are between Iran and some European countries have not always been um, without complications, but there are there is no similar relation of enmity as as, the, as with the U.S. and and Iran hasn't present the U.S. either. I mean, Iran has, has said that it, in response to an attack against its nuclear uh, facilities, it would it might respond by attacking the U.S. bases in the Middle East, but that's very different from saying that Iran would attack U.S. homeland. And, and at the moment, especially after the nuclear deal, Iran, both Iranians and Europeans seem to be more interested in re-establishing their trade relations than attacking each other. So, so the point is that there is an ample window to respond if Iran would uh, break out from the nuclear deal or, or more importantly if they would decide to develop uh, longer range missiles. And, and yeah, when you look at the schedule for the phase three, against intermediate range missiles that Iran doesn't yet have, then you see that it was originally scheduled to take only less than three years. And when you compare that to the three to five year window that is needed for to test missiles, to make them operational, uh, and you see that there's plenty of time to respond, even if the building of the site in Poland would begin from the scratch, which it won't because it's been built for over a year now. So, so it's perhaps not surprising that NATO is now justifying the missile defenses, it, not in terms of Iran, but in terms of the generic threat of missile proliferation. And this text was posted on the NATO website um, a few months after the the Iran nuclear deal, 
and it's basically saying that this system was never about Iran or any any one country, but about the threat posed, posed by proliferation by over 30 countries, uh, proliferation of ballistic missile technologies in over 30 countries, and the Iran deal doesn't change that fact. But when you look at the list of 31 countries with ballistic missiles, then you see that uh, <coughs> about half of these countries are US allies, NATO countries are also included in the, in the list. And when you look at the Middle Eastern countries, you see that most of them only have short-range missiles. And, and there, is, there are only two countries that have intermediate-range missiles, Israel and Saudi Arabia, and they are US allies, so, so they can hardly be seen to justify the site in Poland either. And only Israel and Iran have adv advanced ballistic <coughs> missile programs so that they would be able to build missiles themselves. So, so this argument doesn't really stand closer examination, which leads one to ask what, what is motivating the missile defense system in Europe. And I think these quotes here sum up the motivations quite well. Basically, it's about alliance cohesion and, and the fact that the Romanian and the Polish side, they, they bring permanent troops, permanent U.S. troops to Europe, and that's always seen, seen as good by East Europeans because um, it's like an additional security guarantee against Russia. Um, and there's also the political atmosphere at the moment, the, the crisis with Russia and, and the fact that the US is paying for the system. So that, uh, that explains why there is really no debate about this in Europe. And, and even those who would be critical, they, they would rather not say anything because there's the need to to seem united and not to do anything that might seem like a concession to Russia. Um, the problem with not having like a clear purpose to the system is that some people have started to interpret the adapt adaptability, that principle that was about adapting to Iranian capabilities. Now they are saying that it, or they think that it means adapting to the Russian threat, and for example, I think it was 2013, the Spiegel reported that some East European countries were calling uh, for directing the missile defense system in Europe against Russia, um, and also there are some esteemed experts in DC who, who are promoting this view, for example, Tom Caraco, the director of the Missile Defense Project at, at CSIS, he proposes that um, that the missile defense system should be both against southern and eastern threats, so that um, basically that the um, that the that the SM3 missiles together with Patriots and and cruise missile defense would um, would form this what he calls integrated air and missile defense network against both Russia and Iran. And at least some analysts in Poland seem to have copied this idea almost to the letter. And this is of course very provocative, considering that this was what Russia was suspecting for years, and the U.S. was arguing that no, this is only about Iran and and. So this is provocative, although, and and it seems that the discussion is continuing in NATO behind closed doors about this. Although I think majority of NATO countries understand that the, it's not even possible to turn this system against Russia. And even Tom Caraco acknowledges that the SM3 missiles they um, they can't protect Europe from Russian missiles. So, but anyway, this system, I think, is giving a false sense of security to the Europeans because 
I think not everybody mm -hmm. understands that the interceptors in Europe can't protect Europe from Russia and and um, I think I had a quote yeah from Frank Rose who is the former US assistant secretary of state for arms control who is by the way a big advocate for missile defenses even he uh, acknowledges that uh, or says that he believes there is no missile defense solution to the strategic challenge that Russia presents. And, and another thing is that like all missile defense systems that are tested by the um, or developed by the US Missile Defense Agency, they, they haven't been really tested against realistic threats and um, for example, Ted Postel and George Lewis have have pointed out that that the tests of the SM3 missiles they have been done under very scripted conditions. For example, there is prior information about the the target and when it is launched, and then they have used like um, tail pins that are they that make detection especially easy. And, and also the, there is this report by the Director of Operational Testing and Evaluation and the la latest report notes that none of the, um, none of the missile defenses, you, including the SM3, have included co complex, co complex countermeasures and this is a problem that has, that has uh, been a major challenge for missile defenses since since the 1960s at least. So there is no guarantee that missile defenses would even work against the kind of limited threats that they were that they were meant to be against, uh, let alone against Russia. Um, so, so I think the missile defense, at least the way they are, the NATO is um, Pursuing them now, they are um, actually undermining European security by increasing tensions with Russia, inviting Russian nuclear targeting, and by forming an obstacle for nuclear arms control. And at the same time, they don't really provide any protection against Russia, except, except this sense of security that the US troops are there. And about the link between missile defense and arms control, I already mentioned something related to the ABM treaty and and um, and Star Wars. And but this is more about the link between arms control and the EPAA. Uh, and I already said that I think the Russian concerns are exa exaggerated, and they are exaggerated because. When located in Poland, these SM3 missiles, they can't reach Russian ICBMs. And, and there's also the argument that about the number of interceptors, um, that they can't outnumber the Russian missiles. And, yeah, and that the missile defenses might not even work. But anyway, the concerns are not baseless either, because there are no legal limits and the U.S. is constant, constantly developing and investing on this system, system. So there is uncertainty about the future development of the U.S. missile defense technology and policy. Uh, so, so the number and capability of the interceptors in Europe might also increase in the future. And, and also the Aegis ships uh, are movable. Like they are supposed to be in the Mediterranean, but I think it was already in 2011 when one of the ships went to the Black Sea, and that created um, like an immediate reaction from Russia. And and there's a quote from Dean Wilkening, who published an article in 2012, and his main argument was was that. Um, that the missile defenses in Europe are no threat to Russia, but he also noted that um, if the 
if the ships with uh, with block 2A missiles would be uh, interceptors would be brought to the Baltic Sea, then they might have limited capability against Russian ICBMs. So just to make the point that the Russian concerns are not baseless. Uh, although objectively speaking, Russia should be much more concerned about the Block 2A deployments outside of Europe, um, which are to begin not just in in Poland and in, the, and in Europe, but also uh, in the US Aegis capable ships in the Pacific and, and the Atlantic in 2018. And for example, George Lewis has noted that if, if the ships loaded with these mis interceptor missiles would be located around US coasts, then that could actually, at least in theory, it could provide um, continental missile defense, so clearly undermining both Russian and Chinese nuclear deterrence, assuming that the interceptors would work. And, and also Dean Wilkening, uh, said that in 2012 that uh, if located near US coast, then um, then the block to uh, block to a missiles could in principle give the US a first strike capability. So this is what Russia is worried about and it might seem exaggerated that the prospect that the US would um, strike Russia first, but if if, Russia, if the United States would be in the same position, for sure it would react in the same way. Uh, and Lewis also has counted that, like taking together the plans for for the SM3 interceptors and and the ground-based interceptors here, uh, then by the end of 2030s, the the number of U.S. strategic capable interceptors could be roughly comparable to the Russian strategic um, warheads. And he also notes that if the situation would be reversed, it, this would be unac unacceptable to the to the U.S. And and here's a quote that I think captures well the Russian horror scenario um, about the U.S. first strike and. And it's not just about missile defenses, but also it's it's tied with the with advanced conventional weapons. So so he presents this scenario that high precision weapons are used to carry out a preemptive preemptive strike, while others serve as a shield against a retaliatory strike, and 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 others carry nuclear strikes. So although this seems a bit paranoid, it's still a problem for nuclear arms control. Um, and here's a bit like another si dimension of, of the link between missile defense and arms control. The INF, the intermediate um, range um, nuclear, intermediate uh, range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which was um, which was signed between the U.S. and Soviet Union in the late 1980s. Um, yeah, that I mean, there's the U.S. has long suspected that that Russia was developing uh, ground launch cruise missiles of the of the prohibited range. Like prohibited by this treaty, so 500 to 5,500 kilometers. Um, yeah, the treaty bans those ground launch missiles and also their launchers. Um, and the crisis broke out, I think, this February because the, of the reported deployments by Russia of those missiles. But the but Russia has also presented its own concerns and they have to do with the missile defense plans in Europe because the, the launching system that is used for the interceptors uh, both on the both on the 
Aegis ships in the Mediterranean and the Romanian and soon the Polish side, they, it's like a multi-purpose system and it's good in addition to, to missile defense interceptors, it's good to launch uh, Tomahawk cruise, cruise missiles. And, and because the treaty also bans launchers, this is a valid concern. Um, so that's one way that missile defense is related to arms to the INS treaty, but, but uh, I also argue that there might be a more fundamental connection, I and mean, this is just my speculation, but I think that the Russian INF, the cruise missile policy might actually be motivated at least partly by missile defense, because um, because cruise missiles could also save the, serve the same purpose as, as the Iskander missiles in Kaliningrad, which Russia has said that they their purpose is to take out, if necessary, the the missile defenses in Europe. And the cruise missiles have the have the added value that they are very uh, resistant to missile defenses, and and because of the range, they are also you can also, or the Russians could launch them from the Russian mainland instead of Kaliningrad and and target the sites in Poland and Romania. So, so this is just speculation. But if it's true, then then showing some restraint on the missile defenses in Europe could also have a positive impact on the INF crisis. Um, so finally, my recommendations. So the main recommendation is that the phase three in Poland should be passed. Like they are building the site in Poland and then planning to deploy those block two A interceptors. So I think that should be passed and and those interceptors shouldn't be deployed. And and of course the US should also honor its commitments under the Iran deal. Um, and that should should be done to adapt to the situation in Iran because there is no threat, uh, not as a concession to Russia, but just to be consistent to the to the stated policy. And also, I mean, that would make NATO policy more credible, and that would arguably reduce tensions in Europe and pave the way for arms control with Russia. Um, and it would have no security cost because this is adding nothing to European security except for this false sense of security. And, and more specifically, the potential benefits could include Russia withdrawing the Iskander missiles from Crimea. Nikola is shaking his head. From Kalinin. Okay, uh, and it can be expected to tone down, uh, to bring down Russian threats against European countries that are hosting the components of the missile defense system. And if my speculation about the INF treaty is correct, it could have a positive impact on the INF crisis for because now the US and Russia they are kind of locked into this dynamic that they are just accusing each other of of violations but but maybe this could open the door for for a discussion or on some kind of verification and and it might also prevent or would prevent potential future steps that future steps that Russia would take in response to the completion of the site in Poland and and this could also open the door for the next round of US Russian arms control talks although this is no like a magic key to to that but I think it's a precondition for for that to happen and and here are some quotes by other people to show that my <laughs> My recommendation is not so original, yeah. and other, others have also thought about it. For example, the Deep Cut Commission um, has suggested that the phase three should be postponed and 
the former State Department intelligence analyst Greg Thielman, who is also part of the part of the Deep Cuts Commission, I guess, saying that it's high time for another course of adju adjustment in the EPA implementation, and also the French ambassador to the U.S. has suggested that it's enough what they have done in Europe. 